Uh, great to be here. Uh, so I think we're supposed to talk about the future of crypto, uh, big topic. To start though, I wanted to, uh, uh, so Olaf, well, you were one of the first, I think you started in 2016 before the big boom and everything, and you're one of the biggest investors in the boom as well. So I wanted to step back a little bit, now that it's been two years, uh, we have a little bit of time to see things. Uh, what do you make of like the ICO boom that happened in 2017? What was it like investing during that pretty crazy time? You know? Well, so there's a few things that kind of go into this. So one is that um, I think many people had been excited about Ethereum and the ability to compose more complicated financial instruments that would execute sort of in that secure blockchain environment, much in the way that a Bitcoin transaction is really secure, tamper-proof, all those sorts of things. And so I think it became clear quickly that permissionless capital formation that was just happening exclusively on the internet without regards to sort of real-world identities, bank accounts, geographies, was a pretty big deal, and it became quickly like the killer use case for a young Ethereum platform. Um, now, one of the issues, though, with the ICO boom is that while that is incredible and something that I think is a very, very big deal, um, it's a financial innovation. Um, it's sort of like if you invent um, stocks or you know, equities, it doesn't make for good companies uh, per se, right? So I think that we had a lot of people utilizing a very, very novel financial instrument that I think is really important but without necessarily always um, an underlying you know, thing that made sense to sort of initialize with that sort of capital formation. So what you had was people very, very excited about a new type of financial technology, um, but a lot of noise about what was sort of being built and how capital was being raised with that new financial technology. Um, so the whole thing was very exciting to me, but it was a lot of wading through the noise. I think a lot of the early um, kind of crowdfunded projects, there was a relatively high density of serious entrepreneurs and developers. Um, as 2017 went on, I think the density got lower and lower and lower. Mm -hmm. um, and you saw more like mercenaries come in, raising capital simply because they knew they could raise capital, right? Um, so I think in that environment, it was very dangerous to not know what you were doing. Um, like if you only saw one crypto deal and thought, should I do it? The answer is probably no. Um, but it was, I, I think at the same time, um, it's a great example of sort of cryptocurrency using itself to like accelerate itself. Yeah. So like ICOs are sort of uniquely enabled by cryptocurrency and they mostly funded obviously all cryptocurrency projects. So it's sort of like, um, it's hard for everyone maybe to remember, but like pre-2017, it wasn't popular to invest in cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, and even for like successful businesses like Coinbase say, it was, it was sort of contrarian to invest in Coinbase as an equity investor. Um, and so we sort of like bootstrapped the funding like from ourselves as a cryptocurrency community. Um, now I think cryptocurrency and blockchains in general venture capital is relatively popular, but um, at that time I feel like we sort of had to bootstrap the funding ourselves. Yeah. I, uh, before I, I was in venture, I was a partner at AngelList, which is a crowdfunding platform. And uh, that, the sort of concept of ICOs was got, what got me into crypto. Because we had been like slogging away at crowdfunding, at reggae, doing like SPVs and syndicates into, uh, with accredited investors and things like that. And then here was this ICO thing that uh, within basically six months of its starting, uh, I think at the height of 2017, there was more, the size of the ICO industry was uh, several times larger than the entire early stage VC industry. And that was when I felt like, oh my God, this like, could actually be disruptive to all venture capital yep. and yep. all financing. Yep, but this is, I think this is the right comparison. A lot of people um, that like, look at um, ICOs, for example, treat it like an index or something. Um, of late stage, you know, multi-billion dollar companies, this is the wrong comparison. Uh, the right comparison is like seed stage venture. Yeah. Um, and you have to, you know, we're both seed stage venture investors. Uh, like you're going to lose the money you put in on average. Like mm -hmm. that's just how it works. It's a power law distribution of returns. And there have been several uh, multi-billion dollar uh, systems bootstrapped from ICOs. So it's, 
it's kind of confusing, um, I think, to the outside world because um, it, it, it's very noisy, it's permissionless, so anyone can do it. But in reality, several uh, multi-billion dollar projects have been launched with ICOs, and they've been some of the great investments of the last decade. Yeah. What do you think were some of the most interesting things you saw that came out of that period, like that seeing through the noise, you know? Uh, yeah, so I, I do think that um, there had been a lot of people working on alternative systems for many years that never really had a structure to uh, create, you know, for capital formation to get them off the ground. Mm -hmm. So like Filecoin uh, white paper was 2014. Uh, the Tendermint consensus mechanism that underlies Cosmos um, was 2014. Um, a lot of the research that, that went into Definity was being done over, over 2015. Um, you know, a lot of the work that Gav was doing to create Polkadot was throughout the course of 2016. Like, people had been working on these projects often for many, many years. And, um, like, the Tezos white paper was 2014 as well. Anyway. Yeah. But those folks, like, they didn't really have a means to raise capital to build those projects. Um, there wasn't, like an industry of people prepared to invest in something like Filecoin or Tezos or Cosmos. Um, and th I mean, this was like the thing that made me launch Polychain, mm -hmm. was I knew there were all these really, really like wicked smart developers ready to build these alternative systems, yet there was no business. It was like, it's not a company, right? There's no Bitcoin Inc. Um, so how do you buy it? And you have to feel comfortable with holding actual digital bearer assets and everything that comes with that. Liquidity, storage, all that kind of stuff. And so, to me, like those developers had an excellent opportunity for the first time ever to raise capital for their projects, and they all did very successfully. And those were the projects that I was most excited about investing in. Mm -hmm. um, were, were like serious uh, entrepreneurs that had been working on this for many, many years, way before uh, the concept of ICOs or even Ethereum. So I think all the projects you named are pretty heavy duty infrastructure. Right? Were there any applications that you saw during the or or since that that I think are really interesting and, and it's time for them yet? Yeah. So uh, there's been a trend, I would say, of sort of uh, verticalization or full stack is one way to put it. Uh, so there's a project Cello that uh, we've invested in and that I think is very very interesting. That sort of builds an underlying uh, blockchain. It uses that crypto asset as collateral for a stable coin that's pegged to the US dollar. And then there's an application interface that's like mobile uh, and designed for Android with sort of a light phone number identity system and a, you know, free payments. Um, so it allows, um, it's targeting folks in really the, the developing world who don't have access to traditional financial instruments. There's been a meme in the crypto world for a long time of sort of banking the unbanked. But I don't really think the technology was there. Um, and a big problem was volatility. I think like even a 5% or 2% movement is a big deal for most of this target demographic. So um, you know, I think the ability to have a stable coin that's Android mobile first and also uh, can be cross-border and free because there's no revenue extraction or value extraction at the app layer. All the value accrual for the people that invented the system is really in the cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, this is the sort of approach we're seeing more like product-oriented founders come into cryptocurrency and build. So it's, it's, it's less like these like low-level distributed systems researchers right now that are leaving Google and, and, and Apple and LinkedIn or whatever and, and coming into cryptocurrency. It's like these product-focused founders with a real go-to-market strategy. And I feel like that full stack is finally there where these end user products um, can really affect regular people who don't care about cryptocurrency. And they're also not sort of speculators. Yeah. One thing that, that did actually surprise me was in 2017, there were a lot of visions that I liked, but I just felt like they were too early. They were sort of these applications that had a blockchain thrown on as like a utility token or something. And I, I you know, this actually happened in the, in the 90s too, where there is like most of the biggest flops in the internet era. Uh, actually today, 10, 15 years later, they're reincarnated as $10 billion plus companies. Like Webvan was on demand uh, of you know, uh, groceries and total flop. Now you have Instacart, $10 billion company. Were there, uh, were there anything, was there anything like that that you thought too that's like, okay, this is pretty interesting, but it's just maybe way too early? Too early, yeah. So 
I, I think when you look at um, so-called DeFi, you know, decentralized um, smart contract-based financial instruments, um, the whole concept is can we have a financial contract that executes in this highly secure environment such that you don't really need an underwriter or sort of platform in which that happens. And I think one of the really interesting parts about that is that um, financial instruments are very, they're sort of easy in a sense to define in, in code and they're very um, elegant and simple. Like whether a trade happened or not, or the terms of that trade, it's kind of like a very narrowly defined marketplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think over time, I could see many of these sorts of smart contract-based financial instruments expanding into more complicated marketplaces. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of talk in, in that kind of era of, of this uh, vision of kind of Web3, where we actually build a protocol or decentralized uh, type version of many of the very, very massive web marketplaces we see today. These are things like Etsy, eBay on the marketplace side, you know, Airbnb, Uber, you know, all the way to Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, all these network effect businesses where the value creation is the users, but there's like this value extraction from the company that owns the platform. Um, I do think that while it's, it's still early, we will see over time disintermediation of certain um, forms of those marketplaces. And I think that that was sort of a vision that was first articulated in, in 2017. Yeah. Yeah, my, my big problem with a lot of these was the, just the business model and monetization for people who own tokens. Like how many coins will there be that aren't backed up by any actual productive assets that aren't, don't have a concept of like cash flows that are running through them uh, in, in an online digital way? Um, yeah, so otherwise what, what are you yeah. doing investing well, in that? Yeah. It's, it's like um, at the end of the day, every single cryptocurrency system to work relies on uh, speculators or holders that like take their capital from any other asset class and put it into that cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. However, you can design properties um, that make it make more sense, right? Um, so like if, if Bitcoin's inflation rate was 200% every year in perpetuity, and that was the only variable you changed in the whole system, yeah. um, it would make it, you know, obviously not a very interesting thing to kind of buy and hold. Um, if, if you did that with Ethereum, right, it would have the same effect. It would make it not very interesting to buy and hold. But that would mean that smart contracts built on Ethereum could never hold very much value because you can't have smart contracts composed on a system where it's actually cheaper to attack the underlying system than the smart contract. Mm -hmm. uh, because, like, if you have a derivative contract in Ethereum, that is holding a billion dollars, but Ethereum's only worth a million dollars, obviously you can attack the base chain to take the contract's money. So a lot of this sort of crypto economics, it's, it's actually designing a system that makes it make sense for speculators to want to put their money into. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that's not really computer science, right? It's, it's, more like, um, it's more like designing an economic system that will draw in capital, right? And um, at the end of the day, like I said, there, there's no way to create market cap and therefore security for a lot of these smart contract platforms. You just have to design a system that will draw in those speculators. And I think in 2017, um, there was such, there was not a lot of um, deep thinking about like why one asset might be valuable yeah. versus another asset. Capital. It was just kind of chaos. And so I think people really underestimated how difficult it actually is to design a set of economic parameters such that it like will draw in speculators. Yeah, to make this a little more practical, uh, I think one example that's really beautiful and but maybe an intermediary thing is exchange tokens. And yeah. these, they're mostly centralized, obviously. Um, it's at the whim of the, the exchange to determine, you know, the tokenomics and they can change things uh, very quickly. But ultimately, they are productive assets. I mean, they have cash flows running through them. They take top line of, of fees and they, you know, get it back to users somehow through buy and burn or offering dividends. And uh, it seems like, you know, this is part of the future we talk about of like, all companies might one day have a token and be on a blockchain. How do you think, I don't know if you agree with this, first of all, but second, like, how do you think we get from A, you know, these very centralized BNB and things like that to, a to B to this far out future. Yep, so I do think one really interesting property of these BNB or exchange um, platform tokens is that this is applicable to way more types of business models than just cryptocurrency exchanges. Yeah. Um, 
I think it is, it's useful when it's sort of a platform type business because then the token can have some ability to sort of interact with the platform in a meaningful way. Um, and actually like fee reduction, say, on a trading exchange is pretty simple. I think you can do way more complicated um, um, uh, designs for these sorts of things. So, and then further down like the sort of um, decentralization or smart contract spectrum, you have like the MakerDAO with the MKR token yeah. that's generating revenues not from a business operating, but rather from a, a smart contract operating. Um, and so I do think that over time, you know, this is kind of a spectrum and you will see some odd sort of convergences here. Um, I do think Binance like sometimes looks like a company and sometimes it looks like really it's, a, it's really just a coin. Mm -hmm. And there's like a company that supports the coin more than there's a coin that supports the company, mm -hmm. right? And it's, I, it's kind of like hard to know which one is like the primary, uh, what, what's the primary project here? But it's, it, you know, it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And so to me, yeah, I, I think that you will see these types of assets that aren't really currencies, right? They're not in the concept of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Yeah. They're not meant to be used as money. Um, I think you will see many types of assets like this. I think that they will um, be applied to many things outside of cryptocurrency exchanges and also um, more complex interactions with the base platform. So um, people have, like there's a, a company in Hong Kong called CoinFlex. Um, this, this has come up with a system to distribute the platform token um, that rewards, it, it rewards traders for actually providing liquidity on the exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of liquidity mining, right? The traders on the exchange actually generate the coin, and so that is the coin distribution. Mm -hmm. um, this is the more tightly integrated mechanism with that platform token and sort of the end users. Um, and then it has a very similar buy and burn model that's very similar to the BNB system. Mm -hmm. So I think we will see more things like that. Like I could imagine um, like a, a big video game where by playing it you mine the token, mm. right? And you still pay a subscription fee to the company like you do with Blizzard or, or whatever it might be, and then they can take some of those revenues and do a buy and burn on that token that was again distributed to the gamers, right? There's all sorts of like weird things I think you can do here. And again, like ICOs, this is a financial breakthrough. It doesn't mean the game is good. It doesn't mean the exchange is good, right? It, of course, yeah. It, it, there has to be something there. But there is this accelerant of network effects um, that you can create with these sort of, you know, pseudo centralized, but like based on a crypto asset like systems. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that is a category that we're very interested in kind of investing in and, and looking at over the next couple of years. Yeah, I think if you imagine a future where there are certain companies or DAOs or whatever they are that, uh, Incent, like significantly incentivize their user bases, like you have a decentralized Uber or something that gives a form of equity or top line rev share to their drivers. Of course it will beat Uber. You know, of course it will beat the thing that is not actively giving, giving its revenue back to its users. You know, it almost seems inevitable. And yep. it will be this race to the bottom. Yep, and I think that, um, you know, it doesn't guarantee a 10x product, but uh, it does, in a sense, guarantee lower prices, which is a, is a big deal. Yeah. What do you think, zooming out, like, maybe five years or then 50 years in the future, 50 is pretty hard, but uh, what do you think will be the main effects of crypto on everyday people? Like, how will it change what the world looks like? Um, so, generally, to me, the whole project is, like, taking the world system of property ownership and putting it on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and it just feels like blockchains are a really sort of convenient mechanism to do that. Um, so today, every system of property ownership is very abstract. Um, and I think in the future, it could be uh, much more precisely defined um, y using you know, math and, and, and code and these dis distributed systems. Um, so I think that in a way, that is sort of an infrastructural change, mm -hmm. um, because I think that you know, uh, this is financial breakthroughs. So it's, it's sort of like, I, again, like IPOs, say, or stocks, like in secondary markets to trade equities, it's sort of like a meta innovation that then leads to or enables all of these companies to sort of um, come together and, and have secondary markets and capital formation and everything. But it in itself doesn't like mean that there's these, these companies. Yeah. It, does that make sense? Like, I, I yeah. agree. I think it's interesting, like, Zooming real far back, uh, 
for the first 50 or 100 years after the Industrial Revolution, there weren't like airplanes, there weren't cars. Basically, the innovation was that uh, you could take the way kings lived, you know, with these ultra luxurious products, and you could make it in a mass way, and you could sell it in a cheap, and basically every, like, not everybody, but the average person could live like a king. And I think, like, when you talk about bringing property onto the blockchain, uh, you know, there's a lot of people, including people in this room, who, because of their upbringing, and, and you're born in the U.S., and, and uh, you go to a good school, you have very great access to the financial system. And it's a, it's a good financial, I mean, it's like the best financial system of the last, like, you have, like, significantly easy access to credit. If you want to start a business, it's very easy to find financing. You can invest in any asset you want around the world, and you can have a diversified portfolio for your savings at low cost. But this is, I mean, we live like kings, you know? Like, this is something that most of the world does not have access to. And if you can, if you can give that to someone, anyone who has a smartphone can just tap into, into that global financial system. I think that's, that's pretty cool. Maybe yep. it's not. And yeah, super, I mean, yeah. finance is often sort of unsexy, but it really is the underlying breakthrough that is beneath you know, all of the really tech, technological progress we've had in the last century. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, just given, you know, a more, uh, a more um, you know, topical, a more like timely topic, um, I know that the president of China has made some pretty big statements um, around blockchains and, and everything. I feel like given that um, you guys are kind of investing across both Asia and, and the West, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's most of what we've been thinking of for the last few days. Uh, so yeah, so a week ago, uh, President Xi announced to the Communist Central Party Committee um, that uh, it basically gave a blockchain speech where he endorsed blockchain technology for 10, 20 different use cases that he named, and he said it's a national priority for China uh, to be the number one global leader in blockchain technology. And uh, I think nothing like this, it's been decades since anything like this has happened before. Yeah, and, uh, and in many ways it came as a response to what was going on in the US and with Libra, right? Um, if you think the last time that so many resources um, were, were directed towards uh, such an early stage technology, like it's like NASA maybe, you know? Like some, in the 1960s, right? Uh, and, it was, and I think we're seeing this now, we're, going, we're about to enter in this, into this world of like a, a space race to get the best blockchain technology in your country. Um, and uh, it's actually, I mean, in the last week, basically, so uh, before this, before the announcement, uh, all blockchain conferences were banned in Beijing, the entire province. And uh, in the last week, there have been 8,000 blockchain workshops. So now you have like a billion people who are reading about Bitcoin, tens of millions of people who are uh, learning how to code in Solidity, hopefully the next gen chains as well. Um, it's, uh, I think it'll be pretty noisy. It might be a little bit like 2017, but it's hard to overstate how important it is that a billion people are, are waking up to this, you know? Yep, and the a really interesting property of um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to me is that um, the percentage of people that take the time to comprehend Bitcoin and think it is genuinely a bad idea is very small. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, it's sort of a mind virus where, like, most people, when they find out about it and really understand it, it's sort of um, so obvious and so strikingly powerful an idea. Um, so to me, like a lot of this is really just education and getting more people sort of um, awoken to the fact that this does exist. Mm -hmm. There will, I mean, without a doubt, almost every technical college in China will have an undergraduate blockchain course, you know, by the end of the year or two. There's already dozens that have been announced. Yeah, so I think virus is spreading, as they say. But it's very interesting. I don't know if it will look like what, what we've coalesced to in the US quite yet. I mean, I think the first time blockchain hit mainstream in the Western world was like 13 or 14. And the, everyone's first instinct was like enterprise blockchain and private chains and consortiums. And it, I mean, it took about, where are we now, 2019? It took about five years, four or five years for us to sort of figure out that a lot of the innovation um, and the real leap from zero to one as opposed to just iterative stuff is, uh, is on public chains, the kind of stuff that you and I invest in. So I think that'll take a few years in China too, but it's, it's just like how long it takes to get, the, to get through the maze of, of understanding uh, you know, this crypto innovation. Yeah, and it took some people not that long to realize that private blockchains were bullshit, but um, <laughs> it's, 
Yeah, I think I, I totally agree that they're they're, they're going to go through that. I'm sure. Yeah, and even bullshit is. I mean, like, I think it's just a it's just a question of like, there's some types of technologies that are or for, ways to form a technology that are more iterative, and there's ways that are that are bigger. And even like IBM and Microsoft, they spent the first five years after the internet was invented just doing intranets for everybody. It was like, I'm sure like, they made money off of it. It wasn't unprofitable. There were companies that generated productivity leaps, but nothing compared to like, the productivity leap that is Wikipedia. You know? So I think you know, it's not the, the worst thing in the world, but it's, it's not exactly where you know, we're going to see 10, 100x improvements. You know? You probably just, you agree with all of it, or yeah. I mean, listen. I, Maybe you're strong. Actually, you probably have stronger opinions. No, about. I mean, listen. I um, to me, the whole the whole point is that you get these security properties through decentralization, mm -hmm. um, and if you're not securing the system through economic incentives of you know all the nodes in the system that are providing security, um, like what do you, what do you really have? Um, and so the, this uh, private blockchain to me is like an oxymoron. Um, it's sort of like, of course, the ACH or automated clearinghouse check clearing system in the United States is jokingly slow, right? It takes three days to clear a payment from one person in the US at one bank to another person in the US at another bank. Um, so it's not to say that couldn't be improved. It's just a question of like, you know, I'm not sure that you need blockchains to have substantial improvements to that system. Um, you know, I think it, it could be, you know, maybe some cryptocurrency is better at that, but um, that was sort of the, the main arbitrage to me of a lot of like these private blockchains was basically recognizing that the payment system was so bad that they could sort of use this uh, new buzzword sure. um, to raise lots of capital to, what, to build what is ultimately just enterprise software. Yeah, just a cloud database basically. Yeah. 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 Um, do you think uh, Libra falls, if it ever launch, it launches, does it fall into this bucket? Because it's kind of this weird thing where it's, they say it's a cryptocurrency, but there's, it's not fully permissionless? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it just all, it's the devils in the details there, and it all comes down to the technical design. Um, if, it's, if it's really 100 global nodes that like, can be cycled out and new nodes can be cycled in, you know, that's actually sort of how Cosmos works. Um, and I would consider Cosmos a very decentralized uh, system for its age, particularly. Um, so it's, I, I think it just depends on really ultimately how they design the system. If it's, you know, if it's these 12 people and they're all sort of um, you know, very close with Facebook, well, you know, then it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of more marketing than it is reality. Yeah. So I, I do think the devil's in the details on what they end up with the final design looking like. Yeah. Cool. Time is up. Thank okay. you. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Alex.